Hi, and welcome to the Chicago Public Library's 22nd Annual Poetry Fest. My name is Faith, and I am a librarian with the Chicago Public Library. Today, we will have several virtual programs celebrating National Poetry Month. Our keynote poet, Nate Marshall, will be doing a one-on-one -on -one reading and interview with our rapparian, Roy Kenzie. Following that will be an open mic hosted by Class Hammonds, which is open and free to the public. Please visit shypublib.org to register. Right now, we are about to have our Chicago Poet Showcase featuring Kenneth Coleman, also known as Kenzo, Tara Betts, Quest Hammonds, and Kara Jackson. All Chicago-based poets who will read their work and talk about their experiences and share some wisdom on what it means to be a poet. Action. Hi. Hi, Kenneth. How are you today? I'm well, how are you? I'm great. Welcome, welcome, and welcome to uh, the Chicago Poet Showcase. Uh, today we have Kenneth Coleman. He is a Chicago-based creative who uses poetry to um, educate, entertain, and empower the world around him. Uh, Kenzo uh, has a degree in theater performance and creative writing from Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. Uh, and over the years, he has remained prolific in performing, writing, producing, directing, and hosting many productions. He has also self-published his first book of poetry titled Sandpaper Kisses, Letters Lamenting a Living Lilla. It's a beautiful book. Um, and he's going to read um, a poem from that book today, as well as perform another piece. So, welcome. Hello. Um, this first piece is from my book. I have it in memory, so I can do it from memory. It's called Black Boy and Patchwork. You in my corner was all the affirmation I needed to know that I was destined for greatness. You made me feel strong. No longer alone on this road where the irregularity of my profession composes a future so uncertain. Baby girl, you were my only certainty, a compass, an anchor, a form of emotional security. You accepted me for this beautiful mess that I am. And I'm not the type to seek anyone's approval. I just know that I am an acquired taste. Like, how can a black boy so cis head be so sweet? Like, how can a black boy so timid command such presence so soft-spoken yet violently thunderous silences audiences? Man, it surprises me that I get audiences to cry and witness catharsis. Black boy with bleach hair like Ichigo, hollow chest, sad boy, triple X dressed in emo, grunge, a little androgynous, fly leaf, breaking Benjamin, yes. I listen to that white people stuff while screaming black power. I still want my reparations, my idols. Fred Hampton, Malcolm X, Chief Keef, Uzi, Corrine Gaines, Nina Simone, and Toni Morris. I am not the type to be boxed in. But ever since you left, I, 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 I feel boxed in. Locked in the dungeon of my bedroom like some princess. I am just as distressed as my denim. My soul rips at the seams torn and tattered healing will be deconstructed patchwork. I will be handcrafted and luxury branded by the time I am completed. A rarity, a treasure trove of my own joy and pleasures where I won't dwell over the tethered memories I wear as fashion. I wear these scars like badges. I fought my gym battles with my demons and shadows. I've won the league. I I'm on my way to the elite four now getting back to my core this time without you in my corner. 
The only affirmation I need is myself to know that I am destined for greatness. And that's that first piece. Um, second poem is something I wrote last year after the things that happened with George Floyd and the riots. It's called Black Death is American Fashion. There's a pandemic out there and we've been stuck in the house, but you know what they say. Get out. Get some fresh air. Just keep your distance. Breathe and smell the roses. But where I'm from, this concrete only knows curses. When you're Black, breathing is a death sentence. And the phrase, I can't breathe, becomes a statement piece we wear every time they choose to put a period on our lives. Black death is American fashion. Every viral video is a virtual runway to display a Black body's final moments. Tyra prepared us for this. Why do you think we just stand there and watch and record? We call it spreading awareness. We're only spreading COVID-19 minus 7 equals 12, taking a knee like Kaepernick, lose their jobs. Only difference is administrative leave is a paid vacation for murder. And we want justice. So we protest. So aimless. But some of us want vengeance. We want riots. We want to give that pig the same death sentence and let it run on. And you can say yes. An eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. But maybe that's the only way to leave these racist color blind. Thank you. Wow. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so, Kenna, tell us a little bit more about how poetry was um, introduced to you. Um, it was my junior year of high school. Um, I went to CVS. Um, you know, like how your schools have like libraries in them, and we had got a new librarian that year, Miss Chambers. Um, and she had started a poetry club, and I wasn't doing anything with my life, so I'm like, let me do something, and um wrote my first poem and I just started going to the poetry club. She introduced us to Poetry Slam. We did Louder Than a Bomb. And so that's how I got into it, just going to poetry club and starting out at Louder Than a Bomb. And like, I really fell in love with it. And I'm like, this is what I want to do with my life. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So did you, uh, was that like your first time writing poetry or was that just like a different uh, role for you? That's like the first time I like wrote poetry outside of a class. You know, like how you go in, you know how you have classes and they say, you know, write a poem for English or something. But that was like the first time that I wrote poetry as self-expression and not let me do an assignment. And, you know, poetry is boring and it's not. Like, I really <laughs> love, like, I really love that. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so what, what are some of your favorite, like, modern or living poets? Um... Stephen Willis, you know Stephen Willis? No, I haven't. Heard. Uh, gotta hear Stephen yeah. Willis. Okay. Um, he has this poem. It's called How the Hood Loved You Back. I think that's like one of his biggest poems. It's one called Big, uh, Ebonics 101. But I like Stephen Willis. I like Black Chakra. Mm. Um, yeah, Black Chakra. I like Stephen Willis, Black Chakra. Um, Kyla Lacey. Like, they're all amazing to me. Um, there's another one named Jemai Hill. Um, you you may have seen a poem. He has this poem about the Cash Me Outside girl. Ah, yeah, I have. Oh. Mm -hmm. I, I, like his work is like amazing to me. Um, as far as Chicago artists, I think I think Quest is performing here too. I, I love Quest yeah. work. He's um, K Love, um, Geronimo. Like I really love I really love their work. Oh, yeah, I like K-Love, too. I'm actually a huge fan of hers as well. <laughs> um, and that's awesome. Thank you. 
Thank you um, for having me. Um, so I guess I have one last question, which I'm gonna ask all of the poets today. Um, how has growing up or living in Chicago influenced your writing? And um, how do you want your writing to influence Chicago? Um, as far as my writing, um, it kind of really put me to put me in a space to be very big with my work. I feel like a lot of I feel like when you go other places, other places have their way of work. Like I, like if you go southern, they're like they're big as well, but it's a different kind of big. I think in Chicago, it's more like a technicality to it. There's more. It, it's more of like I feel like an intention behind the work that we that we put and like. Like, and anybody in Chicago will tell you to be like, like, it's just a certain standard to our work. And it's not to say whether we're better than someone, but it's like, if you're going to do this, they really want you to be memorized. You have to have, you have to be memorized. You have to be confident in what you're saying. You could, you could have something very weak, but you got to be confident with it. You have to be memorized. And it's just those certain standards that I feel like Chicago artists bring, especially when we perform out of town sometimes. Um, people will really look at that. Um well, take note of that. And something that I feel like I can bring to Chicago with my work. Um, I went to SIUE, got my degree in theater. Um, I'm hoping I can bring more like theatrical stuff to, you know, poetry and and um, do different things with it. I really want to bring more so uh, a, a, a physical performance to it, uh, make it an art that can tell a story of course it's storytelling but I want to be able to take spaces make any space that we perform in a stage and not necessarily um, up here kind of stage but actually creating a space with creating a stage within the space and moving around in the space while doing poetry and and just just experimenting with different things and what more can poetry be more than me standing on the stage in front of everyone and how we can and make and interweave the audience within our performance as well. Um, I hope I'm not talking too much, but it, you know, weave the audience within our performance as well. That's not just call and respond. You know, like you know, a lot of people, a lot of poets probably would do call and respond. But how can we intertwine the audience with your performance and just being aware of the audience, if that makes sense. Sorry, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much for sharing that. It was a pleasure listening to you. Um, and I, I look forward to seeing you around this, the poetry scene a little bit more. Um, and uh, if so, uh, we have another poet coming in, Tara Betts. Uh, so just stay tuned. Give me one second, okay? Okay. Hi, all. So now we have Tara Betts, who has just joined us. Um, Tara Bess is also another Chicago-based poet. Uh, she is the author of poetry collections, Break the Habit, Arc and Hue, and the forthcoming Refuse to Disappear. Um, in addition to her work as a teaching artist, she's a mentor for young poets. Uh, she has taught several universities, including Rutgers University and University of Illinois in Ch of Chicago. Recently, she taught poetry workshops for three years at Stateville Prison via Prison Neighborhood Arts Project. Wow, okay. Tara uh, is the poetry editor for Langston Hughes Review. Um, and then Dr. Vets is also uh, in the process of establishing the non-for-profit organization, the Whirlwind Learning Center on Chicago's South Side. Wow, you're really accomplished. <laughs> um, and she's going to do a couple of pieces for us today, new pieces, so lucky us. Um, and Tara, whenever you're ready. Sure. Um, since we talked, since you mentioned Prison Neighborhood Arts Project, I'm going to start with a poem uh, that came out of teaching there. And the last time I went in was about a week before shelter in place started. So I've been thinking about them a lot since we didn't even get to finish our semester together. Um, it's called Small Illuminations. One, Albert is a gentle tower. His arms arched over tabletop like bridge beams or girders. Even if he does not understand everything he reads, he smiles 
like a good kid, like the kid he probably was 30 some years ago when he was in the wrong car with the wrong people at the wrong time that he will never get back to. The attention to detail borders on flawless, unscuffed white sneakers, perfected lined fades tucked under precisely folded scullies, immaculate with what you got as a clean, hard fought pride. Three, one week I bring crisp folders, a bundle of sharpened pencils with full pink erasers, round and soft as a doll's blush. They rub away small errors, clearing smudges from a page like an actual correction. Four, I look for Albert's easy grin first when I walk into the concrete block classroom, locked in the education building, relieved that the broken window denies the cold like a plea. One brother in blues with thermal sleeves peeking out of the dull faded ocean of cloth arching over his torso. A cellmate hands me the slightly worn, safeguarded staple bound, <laughs> staple bound book of poems. The signature resolute and matching letters of a poet's name who strolled into prison like a mother without fear of any child. Margaret Burroughs, more than a decade since she left the cell of her body. I clutch her poems, knowing how they pass from her hands like a prayer. We both smile, small illuminations in a dark hell when the cellmate says, Albert wanted you to have this. He got transferred. He knew you'd keep it safe. And um, my second poem is a pandemic poem for sure, but <coughs> I wanted to think about <coughs> this idea of joy. And I think we're in a time now where we probably need it more than ever. So this poem is called Joy Don't Fold or Jingle. In this dystopian viral fog, we somehow managed to dance. In these times where we wonder about evictions and bread, billy clubs and erratic fireworks, bursting skin and nightly sleep, we laugh. We remember Bill Withers and Prince. We celebrate Betty Wright and Gwendolyn Brooks. There are litanies of names braiding our histories to pride and terror. And we say, you have not devoured our clapping our embraces, our almost solar smiles. We will not give all of them to the ugly. What is hideous in this world has not earned that privilege and what it has was stolen. We are no longer shushing thieves like arrogant children. We demand that they restore, apologize, repair, unlearn, relearn a world where joy is not for sale. Whether the currency be lives or paper. So thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and thank you for reading. Um, so uh, I'm asking all of the poets a couple of questions. Uh, sure, sure. And so I guess what I want to ask you is um, if you could bring any poet back from the past, which poet would you bring and why? God, there's so many. Um, for today, I'll say this, for today, the two poets I probably wish were here. One would be Lucille Clifton, because she was my teacher. And I think about her a lot. And I, there are a lot of conversations I wish we could have had. Mm -hmm. um, I have her poem tattooed on my arm. So I carry her with me a little bit. Um, the other poet that I've been thinking about lately is also, was also a fiction writer. His name was Henry Dumas. Mm. And a lot of people have been bringing his <laughs> name up again because his collection of short stories, Echo Tree is about to come back out on Coffee House Press, but he was killed by police officers in the Harlem subway system. Wow. He was really good friends with Sun Ra and he was leaving practice from hanging out with Sun Ra and he got shot under very mysterious circumstances, like nobody knows what happened or why. And he was 33 years old. And I think because of 
how he died, a lot of people are thinking about his story again, like many of the stories for a lot of people we've lost. Wow. I didn't know that. Um, thank you for sharing that information. That's amazing. Thank um, you. I hope a lot of people look him up. He wrote, Yeah. I think you can still find like Knees of a Natural Man mm -hmm. on Amazon or Okay. At your local library, probably. Yes, <laughs> your library. Please check us out. <laughs> yes. Yes. Him. I'm sure he's in the CPL system somewhere. De definitely. We have an entire floor dedicated to just poetry at Harold Washington Library. So I'm pretty sure he's in there somewhere. Yes. I spent <laughs> a lot of time on that floor. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so I'm going to ask you the question I asked Kenzo earlier. Um, how has being in Chicago influenced your writing and how do you want your writing to influence Chicago? Oh my gosh. I feel like I wrote poems as a kid. I grew up in Kankakee, but I moved to Chicago to go to college. And I think between higher education and being in the city, it helped me mature as a poet it kind of widened my lens of what to look at in the world and you know what does it mean to be a midwestern girl particularly a black midwestern girl right and <laughs> if chicago hadn't given me that i might not have pursued all these other things that i have done mm -hmm. but in terms of what i hope to give back i hope that you know my poems, my writing does something to affect change in the world. I hope that people I've been able to help or reach out to or teach as a result of that can affect some change in the world too. And hopefully that's a way to give back. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna actually ask both of you a question um, uh, before we um, let our next poet in. Um, if you have any advice for someone um, who wants to write poetry for a living. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't laugh at that question. Um, but finish, what were you saying? No, that was the question. Do oh, you have funny. any advice for anyone who wants to write poetry for a living or to at least get published? <laughs> I think... <laughs> Let me catch my breath for a second. Do you want to pick it up first, Kenzo? Because my cough, it's, it's allergy season. I understand. Um, that's some very <laughs> loaded. I don't know. Um, I don't know what advice to give. I would say to be observant of the world around you. Um, I feel like when I first started writing, I wasn't too observant of a person. So when you observe more, you can take in more and like learn from your classes. Like if you're a younger person and you're still in school, make sure you soak up all the information you can from your classes because you can use all of that in your work. Don't take it for granted. Don't take anything you learn from granted. Don't take, don't take anything you learn for granted. That's my advice. I love it. Um, and that's all good advice. I agree with Ken. Um, for me, I would probably say, other than read voraciously, I, I find <laughs> that now when I talk to poets, everyone is so concerned with the commercial aspect of poetry. Mm -hmm. And it really turns me, it bugs me a little bit and it turns me away from the art form because there are so many people, particularly if you're Gen X or older, where you had to create everything. There was no venue. There was no television shows. There was, maybe you had a slam or an open mic and you published your own books. And now that people have been integrated into the academy as slam poets and so on and so forth. And there's all these writing communities for writers of color, which I really appreciate. I feel like People think if you're aligned with the right group, that's going to get you in the door. And for some people, it has. But you have to always come back to what made you want to write in the first place. 
because institutions and systems will make you start thinking about what you need to do to get ahead. They won't make you think about that work of the heart that makes a poem. All that stuff starts in here. What's the thing that won't leave mm -hmm. and keeps, what's the story you have to tell? And why do you keep going back to that story? Why is it important? I feel like there's not enough people asking that question mm -hmm. or they ask it just enough to make sure they get published by the right press. Mm -hmm. I don't want to write those poems. And I think sometimes you'll end up paying for it. You may not get where you want to be career wise mm -hmm. or money wise, but you also don't feel like you've sold your soul. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it's like, <clears throat> because I was such a voracious reader and I was like, I'm willing to do a lot of different things. I think you need to be flexible as a writer. You know, whether you become a publisher and an editor and you you figure out different ways to sell your books or sell product, like all of that stuff, that's not writing the poems. That's the business, mm -hmm. right? So you may have to be business minded, but you have to keep your poet heart alive. Okay. Thanks, Tara. That was excellent. And thanks, Kenzo. Now we have another poet that's about, about to join us. Quest Poetry, um, and we'll be right back. Hi, and now we have Quest, um, who's joined us. And Quest is a South Side poet, born and raised on the South Side of Chicago, uh, who also identifies as a wordsmith, a visual artist, and uh, a photographer. And uh, he started his career in 2010 as a spoken word poet uh, with um, Lyric as a mentor and a member uh, who was headed by K-Love and Phenom Poet, yeah? Um, so Quest is gonna read for us and then we're gonna ask questions. Uh, you ready, Quest? Call me is this time. Okay. Rose Bush, tell me what we love for. Who sold the dream of this love lore? We caught cases in our briefcases is a love hoard. We love hard just until we love sore, trying to soothe the pain that this love bore with unborns. Hate, then jealousy was known as little brother. Wrapped around the finger became the sister. Now we're all sprung and all just siblings trapped in a state of love war. Covered in clothes and clovers, the season is lucky. The battle fierce, but love versus love ain't winning. Why we like this, kiss like this, Hug with space, a tongue is bliss. We split like a blossoming rose. But who lied to us and said we represent the rose plucked? We like a rose bush tangled, getting stuck at a thorn's root. We don't like this. Or maybe I should write, dear love, in sonnets. Are we a couple yet? Maybe rose bushes are best in couplets. I made you a rose out of fire, you dragon heart. I breathe your smoke. My heart's already high enough. I second hand your lips for a repeat kiss and make a wish off the flight of your wings as you ascend. But we dive in dirt. We bleed without the skill to pluck roses from the bottom, a difficult task, but never got cheered on or heard the roots, roots for us. It's much for us. Maybe we should make use of the thorns like Jesus. We thick at the stems. We've been through a lot. We grow and we grow. We grow at the fork where roses made the road. And if we're roses plucked, then we should have been shriveled up. We are the cure and the curse of this rose bush. That's that piece. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Quest, born and raised from Chicago, um, what are yes. some of your favorite living poets? from Chicago? Uh, my, my, my favorite living poet uh, from Chicago is a poet by the name of Drea. Mm -hmm. um, she's absolutely amazing. I love her so much. Like, she's super dope. Is there anything particular about her work that resonates with you? 
Ooh, um, her skill, her pen hand is like really, really dope. It's deep. It's um, it's very knowledgeable, um, and it's powerful. She's so petite, but, but she's so powerful, and I think that's what I most appreciate and like about her writing is that how powerful that it is. Okay. Um. So can you like, well, your work is also powerful. <laughs> um, so can you walk us a little bit through your, like your writing process? Like how do you start a poem? So um, when, when I get in my mode and my creative space of writing a poem, um, I think about what I want to write about. And once I figure out what it is that I want to write about, whether it's like the color blue or the color red, I try and see how well I can stretch the idea of what I'm writing. So there's so many things that's the color red. There's so many things that's the color blue. So in my head, I want to dive deep into how far can I stretch the idea versus me just writing like, okay, red, and then couple it or double it up with so many other like influence. I try and stay in the scheme of it. So that's normally my thought process with anything that I write. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, so how has growing up or living in Chicago influenced your writing and how would you like your writing to influence Chicago? Um, so growing up in Chicago, um, as beautiful as the city is, like this city is so beautiful, so, so beautiful. Um, we, we still have to realize the reality of certain things that go on in the city, which isn't necessarily good. So there's like this yin and yang factor so with this yin and yang fact, as beautiful as the city is, we also have the negative sides of things. And the negative sides of things actually inspire me to create an antidote with my poetry. So I think of my poetry as plant a seed or an antidote. So I wanna change the, the receiving end of what's poured in and make sure that it's pos positivity, that, that it's positive on the outcome. So being in a city as such, we get so much of the darker side of things. And I have the ability to turn this darkness into a light. So how Chicago inspires me in creating this antidote or creating this light, I will hope that my poetry does the same and inspire others to always see the beauty in that whole yin and yang factor. Wow, that's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. So a question I've been asking um, other poets as well is if you had any advice for someone wanting to write poetry or publish poetry for a living or? I would say practice your craft, um, never settle ever. Um, definitely practice your craft. Um, in most cases, like myself, when we start writing, we are trying to create. So if you keep that in mind when you're writing and actually create, I think that's the best advice I can give. Don't accept an object. Don't accept a theme for just what it is. Create from it. And, and when you are trying to create, you're utilizing the muscles, you're utilizing your brain, you're really trying to figure it out because you're creating different avenues as your poetry should. So I would definitely say practice and always create, always, always. Okay. Thanks so much, Quest. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed this. This is super cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we do have another poet coming in, Kara. She's also from Chicago. Nice. Um, so uh, she'll be right in. Cool beans. Okay. Hi, Kara. Welcome. <laughs> uh, welcome to CPL's uh, Chicago Poetry Showcase. Um, so Kara Jackson is the author of Bloodstone Cowboy, um, published by Haymarket Books in 2019. Um, Kara also made her musical debut with an EP, um, A Song for Every Chamber of the Heart, which was self-released. And her work has appeared in the Poetry Magazine. Is that the Poetry Magazine? Yeah. Cool. Frontier Poetry, Rookie Mag, Nimrod Literacy Journal, The Lily, and St. Huron. Um, and uh, you're also a TEDx speaker. How cool is that? <laughs> 
Um, you're gonna have to share the link later. All right, Kara, so you're gonna read for us? Yeah. All right, let's go. Okay, so this is a poem, a newer poem of mine called Fleeing. Everything I do comes down to the fact that I've been here before. In some arrangement of my atoms, I was allowed to be free. So don't ask me when freedom is coming, when a certain eye of mine has seen it. A cornea in a convoluted future recalls my freedom. When asked about the absence of freedom, the lack of it, I laugh at the word absence, which always suggests a presence that has left. But absence is the arena of death, and we call the dead free, went on to glory. What is the absence of freedom but an assumption of it? I have never longed for something which was not once mine. Even fiction is my possession. And flight is an act of fleeing as much as an act of flying. So the next, oh, so I'm reading another one too, right? <laughs> oh, if you want to, uh, did you want to read another one? Sure, why not? I haven't read amazing, poems in a second. Thank you. Okay, the second poem is a poem from my book, uh, my chapbook, Bloodstone Cowboy. Um, and it's a poem about my grandma called Mean Streak. I want to be as threatening as beet juice to a clean white, threatening as a sharp wind to a shown ankle. I want people to pay to see me like a horror movie, fear prepared in their pockets. I want to be more threatening than a red notice on an envelope. When I speak, I want my mouth attached to a warning, like a small thing that can be swallowed. I want to threaten the way fat does a button, hips filling my jeans like ammo. Grandma Thelma wears her mean like a girdle. My mother says I'm almost as mean as her, that my mean grows as a streak in my hair. God, make me as mean as Thelma. Give me a mean I can hide behind, a mean that fastens me into a dress, a mean I'll pull out of my drawer. Let the mean conquer my hair, like troops poking for surrender and then grow to my ankles. Even the ants will see the steam. Wow, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so are you, are you born and raised in Chicago or? I grew up, um, I was born in Oak Park, Illinois. So just outside of Chicago. Okay, so are you, um, but you're a Chicago resident now, right? I live in Oak Park now as well. Oh, okay. That well, that works. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, do you have any favorite like Chicago poets? Yes, very much so. I mean, my main inspiration growing up was Gwendolyn Brooks. Okay. Um, I'm a huge Gwendolyn Brooks fan, and also Patricia Smith, um, who's from the West Side. Um, I love. Jamila Woods, who is known for her singing, but also she's one of my favorite poets. And my best friend, Jelly Frazier. Um, and yeah, I think that just growing up, I came up in the Chicago poetic scene. So most of my peers are my biggest inspirations. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you. And um... If you could bring back any poet from the past, which poet would you bring? Ooh, I would say Lucille Clifton. Oh, uh, another poet just said her. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, I mean, I feel like that's just such an obvious like choice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there a reason why? I think that I would just love to ask her about her process. I think that also because her relationship to like visibility and like she didn't, her poems didn't start getting published until she was a grandmother. 
Um, that's when like she really started publishing her work. I would definitely ask her about kind of the merit of being having that type of experience in life and starting to be visible at a time where you've lived so much life. Um, I think I would definitely want to talk to her about that and like her process and also how she persevered, like what being an artist meant to her since she wasn't, I think we're really used to now being like, you know, really young and being visible and we have social media, but I'm wondering what she would think about what it means to be an artist, especially if you're not necessarily recognized as one right away. Oh, wow. Okay. That's a great answer. <laughs> Um, so uh, do you mind just walking us through like a start of one of your poems, like what your writing process is? Yeah, I think sometimes every poem is different, but I usually start with like either a form or sometimes type of framework to think, to think about as I'm writing before I write anything down. And then I usually just like free write and I don't edit anything yet I just write down whatever is in my head even if it's really bad and then I think like the real writing part comes in the editing so I think my editing process is really really intentional and really meticulous in terms of figuring out what lines go together and what lines are just bad <laughs> and how I want to frame the poem with the title too I think like titles are really important so I think that's kind of how I write most of my work Okay, that's awesome. Um, do you have any advice for someone wanting to write public, I mean, sorry, to write poetry or publish poetry? Yeah, I think that my advice to any writer would be, especially young writers, would be to read. I think that reading is fundamental and it's essential to writing. I think that I wouldn't be able to write my favorite poems if I didn't read other people's work. So I think before you get caught up in like, I have to be in this journal or whatever, just read journals, just read other people's work and think about how long some of those processes actually take before you get like discouraged. Like, I think that that would probably be my advice. Yeah, okay, that's really good advice. Read, read, read. Um, so then my last question is, is, um, how has Chicago influenced your writing and how would you like your writing to influence Chicago? Yeah, I think coming up in the art scene generally because I'm a singer too in Chicago has really taught me the necessity of community. I think that I can't think of art as a individual process. I think that my work is totally informed by the community and the people I have around me. And also I think as an extension of that, also my art is situated in community. I think I write a lot about the people I'm around. I write a lot about my friends and my family and the people who I'm, and the experiences I have that are right in front of me. Gwendolyn Brooks always said to write what's under your nose. And I think that that's kind of the greatest lesson that I've gotten from Chicago and from Chicago writers. Mm -hmm. And I think, I guess, to answer the second part, what Chicago has done for my work, right? Um, or was, what influence did you want to have on Chicago? Oh, what influence? Yeah. I mean, I think that I just am more concerned about, I don't know, I just am always trying to do the right thing in terms of lineage and bringing up the way that people brought me up when I was a kid, like I was performing on stages when I was, you know, 16 and 17 years old. I want to just kind of pass the torch down. I think if anything, I want my influence to be the youth and the younger people. I want to make sure that there's space for the people who are coming after me. So I don't really necessarily think about my impact as an individual, but again, like collectively, I want to make sure I'm you know, doing what I can to make sure this artistic space remains how it was, the artistic space that embraced me at one point. So trying to kind of pass that embrace down to other people. Okay, thank you. That was awesome. Thank you, Kara, for joining us today and reading your poetry and sharing a little bit of yourself with us. Um, 
And thank you all for tuning in. Please stay tuned for our next segment, which is actually with Nate Marshall. Um, and he will be doing a live Q&A and reading for you all uh, coming right up. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.